Hi, and welcome to Bookster Diversity. I'm Associate Editor Christy Dishman, here with Meg Elison, the Philip K. Dick award-winning author of the Road to Nowhere trilogy. We are so excited to have you. Welcome, Meg. Good morning. It's nice to see you. Meg has recently written The Book of Flora, the powerful conclusion to her highly gendered vision of the apocalypse, a world in which women, after having been wiped out by a virus, are commodified and hunted down for reproductive purposes. A very grim premise. I suppose it is. Uh, I wrote it, at least the first one, I wrote in a very grim frame of mind, so it was impossible to, do, to escape that for a long time for me. Of course. You've said before that the way in which people envision the world ending is a highly personal thing. You can kind of tell somebody's worst fears, their hopes, um, through how they present that vision. So how have some of your own experiences kind of come into play in this narrative? I read almost everything I could find that was in English about dystopian societies or post-apocalypse societies. And that became apparent to me immediately, whether people were really concerned about their medical needs or about whether they were armed enough. And it just, it shook me to my core that really nobody wrote about the fact that just about every adult woman that you know, that you've ever known has been on birth control her whole life. Absolutely. And at probably a maximum of six months, none of them will be able to get it anymore. And that scared me like nothing else ever had, because without it, women had very little autonomy. And then some, sometimes now we still don't. And uh, if that is the end of the world, then I don't know what is. Of course. You've, uh, you've said before that some of your influences for uh, female-driven dystopian works have been uh, Octavia Butler, uh, Margaret Atwood. But what would you say any of your influences have been in terms of queerness? in apocalypse scenarios? That's really difficult because there are so few queer dystopian stories. I'm not trying to discount any authors out there who are doing of the course. same thing, but when I investigated the canon, it just didn't come up that much. It comes up a little bit in The Handmaid's Tale when she discusses what she calls gender traitors and it's all very subsumed. But there's this thing about apocalypses where people think that we have to save the species and to save the species, we have to engage in compulsory heterosexuality and whoever can breed will breed, right? And then uh, queerness just sort of disappears because it no longer has a utility, I guess. And I, I just hated that idea. So most of my queer influences come from writers who didn't write about the end of the world, but were writing about the difficulty of being queer in a place that didn't value that. So Oscar Wilde was huge for that. And so was uh, Virginia Woolf, especially Orlando. Orlando was a major book for me in many ways. Of course. And how does being one of the one of the first people to insert such queerness into these dystopias, how does that influence your writing process, knowing that this is going to be the first sort of work of this nature that a lot of people encounter? I never want to say first because I can't read everything and I know that there's probably mm -hmm. something important that I've missed, but let's say read one the first. <laughs> I really do. I want to read everything and mm -hmm. I want to live forever, but you know, but being, let's say one of the first, uh, I didn't think about the weight of it or the importance of it until after the book came out, which is frankly great because if you think mm -hmm. about your legacy while you're writing, you'll never write. Like you'll just sit and be terrified. Of course. <laughs> But I started to hear about it a lot in uh, fan mail, which I'm very lucky to get, and how surprised people were to see themselves represented in a dystopian story, which are usually just so heterosexual and so focused on one kind of building a family. So I, I really loved that, and I feel privileged to be able to do it, and I feel like mm -hmm. I'm just representing like the people that I know. Like These are my friends. Of this course. is what my friend group looks like. Like I feel like I, I know barely any straight people anymore, and yeah. partly... <laughs> I live in the Bay Area, and that's that's mostly mm -hmm. what also I'm just lucky. Of course. Of course. Please tell us a bit more about your decision to um, to make the protagonist of the Book of Flora transgender, because that is extremely rare in a book of this nature. I wanted to write about renegades of gender of all different kinds, and it, it always uh, struck me as really strange that we view androgyny as the addition of masculinity to anything and then the addition of femininity genders something to the point of deviance that we think of mm -hmm. as trans women as the most highly gendered people so i started in the book of the unnamed midwife with a cis woman who dresses in drag i wrote the book of edda about a person of fluid gender or a person who is bi-gender and then the logical conclusion 
was Flora, who should be the most gendered person in this universe. Uh, but it was also really outside of my experience, so it required much more research on my part and, uh, and hiring sensitivity writers to make sure that I wasn't wildly out of my lane. Of course. Of course. And what was your what was your research process like? Because many writers find that that is such a complicated part of the process, you know, getting everything right and making sure that people's stories are correctly represented. Some of my research was really social in nature and uh, I needed to spend more time in trans communities and I sought out trans arts shows and trans poetry readings. And again, living in the Bay Area, I'm really lucky to have access to all that. I read a lot of memoirs and books mm -hmm. by trans writers like uh, Julia Rios and uh, the Lady Chablis. And I also um, I had to do a lot of medical research because I wanted the trans people of the future to have taken their need for hormones into their own hands and to try to recreate it on some scale without a major pharmaceutical industry behind them and try to figure out what that would look like. And I ended up with something that was half pharmaceutical and sort of half ritual but nevertheless belonging to the people who need it. Of course. And what are the ways in which you've incorporated some of your own experience, some of your own earlier experiences into this, into this world, just because any act of writing can be so personal at the same time as you are discussing other people's stories? It really is. Uh, it's always personal. And every piece of art you create is self-portrait. You can't help that. Mm -hmm. So I had, a really, I had a really difficult childhood. We were itinerant and about as poor as it is possible to be in the first world. And so I incorporated a lot of that difficulty into the way I wrote these people. It's, it's, it's cliche, but you know, people who don't have anywhere to sleep, are exp they're experiencing the apocalypse right now. So uh, I, took, I took those hardships and the things that I had to learn to do for myself in order to survive. Uh, and wrote them into a world that was maybe just a little less friendly than the one I live in. Of course. No, I don't think that's cliche at all. I think that's extremely, <laughs> extremely powerful. So, <laughs> but um, I do know that you, you that you began this series um, when you were still, when you were wrapping up your college process. Were there previous iterations of this book, you know, different ways in which the story kind of told itself to you, or did it really come to you all at once? So there are previous books. I, I have unpublishable novels from my early 20s that mm -hmm. will never see the light of day. But this book, uh, there were no previous iterations. There were no short stories. This, this, idea, this idea came to me whole and perfect just before uh, my last group of finals at Cal. And I knew exactly what it was going to be and what I needed to say and what the length of it was. And I wrote it really quickly, which is uh, a great gift in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are parts of it with such this raw, immediate first person tone to it, especially in the diary aspects. As a meticulous diary keeper yourself, how did that impact your writing? It's kind of a cheat, honestly. Uh, yeah. You can write a lot of intimacy into a, a first person character by having them experience the story firsthand, but you you never get any distance from the events. The best you can get is their immediate reaction and sort, sort of a, a factual reporting of what they're doing at this exact moment. The thing that I love about diaries is you're there with your first person experience with all of your emotions about it, and also you've had a little time to think about it. So you're reflecting on how this fits into your patterns and what you expected versus what actually happened and what you think will come of these things in the future. It's, uh, it's, it's an extremely intimate way to be with a first person character, even more than sharing their thoughts. You're sharing their thoughts and their thoughts about their thoughts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, one question that I do have is because given the, given the timeline of this series, I know that you, well, all, all sci-fi, all dystopia, all apocalypse, there's something inherently political about it. And I know that you started the series before, you know, the infamous election, when things became so much more heavily politicized. Was there anything about those events that changed the way you were writing this or kind of influenced your mindset while you were writing? Definitely, yes. Uh... I started writing the first book during what was called in its first stages, The War on Women. It was, you know, mm. in the, it was, it sort of started right after Romney's Binders Full of Women gaffe, which seems so innocent and small looking back. It's almost ridiculous, right? Quite uh, a comparison. It is, it really is, considering the times we live in now. 
But even then, uh, reproductive freedom was being rolled back in, in many, many states, just as it is now. And every time one of those pieces developed and every time somebody tried to pass a bathroom bill so that trans people couldn't use the right bathroom and every time somebody tried to make birth control harder to get, it just added fuel to this fire that never stops burning and right from rage. And then I was writing Flora during the election of 2016 and I, like a lot of naive white people, thought I knew how that would turn out. I remember. And uh, when it... God, that was an awful day. So after that, um, I had almost written Flora entirely and I had to go in and tear out about the last 40% of it because it was too grim and it was too hopeless and I was living that and I didn't need to write that and I just wanted it to go somewhere better. So I think, I think there's not much good that came out of that election, but I think it made Flora a more hopeful book. Of course. And how do you find yourself striking that balance of hope and darkness when you're dealing with such difficult and heavy subject matter? How do you as a writer kind of lift the tone slightly or change the way that that comes across? Because you do, you really do, so. I think about the moments in post-apocalyptic books that I have loved where the characters get a little something of what they needed or what they wanted and how much of a relief or even a luxury it felt like. I think about there's a great scene in Cormac McCarthy's The Road where they discover an untouched bunker where they find Cheetos and uh, instant coffee and bottles of whiskey and just how amazing that felt. I think about some my early reading, like when I read Laura Ingalls Wilder as a kid, like they lived in this really harsh environment and they very rarely got any pleasures. But the, the, the best part was almost always Christmas. So I I tried to write that Christmas feeling into a little bit. I also, I came to love these characters. I'm I'm not George R.R. Martin. I don't love to see them tortured and killed. Of course, no. Uh, So the more I started thinking about them as friends and intimates, the more I wanted them to have what they wanted and to have what they needed. And that that made it reasonable to write, even in those circumstances. I didn't make it easy for them, but I did give them... No, it can't be. It can't be too easy. Um, but as a as a writer, Just like real life. No, no, it's never too easy. Um, dealing with such difficult topics. This is not necessarily a question about the writing, but about you. How do you maintain the right headspace to write these stories when you're dealing with such challenging topics? That's a good question. <sighs> I won't say that I'm not affected by the stories that I read and write. I definitely am. I think, I think I keep it balanced the same way I keep my life balanced. I think I have to acknowledge the things that are true and the things that are difficult and also uh, look for any excuse to have a moment of joy. So I remember in some of my worst days, my friends will be absurd with me or they'll suggest that we do a very frivolous outing, like we go buy sealing wax or we go... Mm-hmm drink and dance for no reason. I think I I keep it, I I do self-care the same way in my novels as I do in my life. Absolutely. The little things are incredibly, incredibly beautiful and not so little at all, of course. Thanks. So um, a question about this book specifically. Um, Given the fact that you're concluding a trilogy, you know, a very vast, vast expansive trilogy that deals with a lot of serious ideas, uh, how did it feel to go about concluding that, wrapping everything up? What were you taking into account as you were closing your story? I had to remind myself that nothing's ever finished. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no such thing as a story's end. It's just the place where we stop talking. I, I had to remind myself that I wasn't going to be able to get to everything as much as I wanted to. I, I introduce a concept near the end of Flora that I'm really fascinated with that I would love to write more about, mm-hmm. but this just wasn't the place to do it. <laughs> uh, I had to remind myself that the goal was to get these characters to the place where they should be and that everything that happens after that is another story. Uh, it It feels like a professional accomplishment, but it also feels like You know those videos that we all watched in the 80s and 90s where the old man sits in a wingback leather chair and reads to you from a book and tells you they all lived happily ever after and then closes that final leather cover? Like, There's an incredible completion to that feeling, to knowing that we've reached the end and and things are as well as they possibly can be. So that's, that's a kind of satisfaction that I've gotten nowhere else. Of course. So does that mean that we won't see anything further in this universe? Or is that... I won't say no. Okay. I I like this universe and 
uh, this sounds really craven, but the, the difference is made honestly in the way the book industry moves. If I were to get a contract that would allow me to write more books in this vein, I would do it. I would love to write the book of Max. Of Max is one of my favorite characters yeah. I've ever created. And I would love to go back into Shy. But uh, the reality is I have, I have four or five more books I'm working on now. I have other things that I really want to do. I really want to move into YA. I really want to write horror. And, uh, and so I would like to do something different for a while, but I won't say never. Of course. Now, speaking of your speaking of your characters, how do you go about creating such you know such nuanced individuals? Are you more of a steal from real life kind of writer, or uh, what's your process like? This is how I get sued, right? Right. Exactly. That's my plan here. <laughs> <laughs> I do absolutely steal from real life, uh, but I don't steal whole people. I try to steal characteristics that I think are interesting. I'm a champion eavesdropper. I will listen to people in cafes and on the bus and mm -hmm. on BART. And, uh, and I will listen to the way that they talk and think about who they probably are that made them develop their own, their own idiolect that way. I like to steal physical characteristics. If somebody has a really distinctive face or something about their body I find compelling, I'll do that too. So what I end up with is these patchwork quilts of, of mm -hmm. qualities and, and little foibles and little tweaks and torques that everybody has. And it ends up being, I, I'm, I'm glad you think they're nuanced, but I, I try to make people very whole because nobody's just one thing. Everybody is a lot of things. And the more you make a villain or a hero one thing, the less your story feels like life. Absolutely, absolutely. And I don't think they're nuanced. I know they are, so <laughs> don't <laughs> sell you. yourself short. Um, As a reader, you're qualified to say that, so thanks. Excellent. So many writers, sometimes when they're creating these characters, they find themselves slipping into the character. Do you ever have that struggle as a writer when you feel the personal moving too much into your narrative, like you have to make a separation, or is that not really a problem for you? I pretty rarely have that problem. Mm -hmm. I think most in, in decision making because sometimes as a writer you need people to make bad decisions mm -hmm. and and you if you put yourself in their shoes you think well I would never do that but also you have to remember that you know things that they can't possibly know so they're working with limited information and they make the the, the, the decisions that they're going to make uh, but that that's a pretty easy habit to develop once you have it uh, and I, I very rarely write about myself. I, I wrote a little bit of myself into the character of Madame Max just because I found it mm -hmm. delicious and seductive and couldn't stop. But for the most part, I try to think about the people that they become and the experiences that have shaped them and how that person would do this thing. It's almost never my thing. So when you are writing these characters then, do you know exactly where their character arc is going to end or do you feel them arriving there based upon the choices that they make? I almost always know where we're going. Uh, I am sometimes surprised along the way on how we get there. Mm -hmm. I've always thought of it as the height of hubris when our authors tell me that their characters boss them around or come sit in their living room and surprise them. I mean, everybody does it their own way, but I always thought that was a lot. That's very mm -hmm. imaginary tea party. <laughs> but uh, because of those experiences that shape them, I do come to places where I intended them to turn right. And because of who I've made them to be, they have to turn left. Mm -hmm. And that's not so much as a surprise as an inconvenience. <laughs> You're not doing what I wanted you to, but also you can't unless I make this into unbelievable artifice. And I'd rather not course but then you figure it out you do you do and it's almost always better when you do if I let the story be what it's organically becoming instead of trying to force it someone can always tell someone will always write in an interview in a, in a review that this only happens so that this character would do that and they're usually right mm -hmm. have there ever uh, been any moments that truly surprised you that you didn't know that you were about to arrive at and if it's a spoiler you can vaguely elude this is a little spoilery but there is a character who is reintroduced to the narrative near the end of the book of flora who i was pretty sure i was just done with i was not going to bring them back and then the moment appeared and i was like oh i should bring them back <laughs> Uh, there's also a little incident in the book of the unnamed midwife because I desperately wanted to write what happened to Roxanne mm -hmm. and I had to slide my perspective to do it. I've taken a lot of dings from reviewers. I, I, one reviewer, I will never forget. I try not to read bad reviews, but this is a professional. One reviewer called it my, my rookie mistake. 
Now, one more question. But I, I really wanted to know. Oh, yeah. Sorry to cut you off. You're fine. <laughs> go ahead. Before we uh, before we go into any audience questions, not everyone in our audience may be so familiar with your work. Although I'm sure they have a better idea now about just how immersive it can be. <laughs> um, what would you What would you say about the world that you've created to someone who's not familiar with it? Something that's not on the book jacket, right? Something that can only come from you. I always tell people that it's. It's probably grimmer and more violent than they am because a uh, book cover copy almost never specifies that. Right. Uh, so I like to give a warning if I can. Uh, if you have trouble with sexual assault or gendered violence or birth trauma, to be gentle with yourself and maybe don't undertake to read it all at once. And if you need to stop, stop. There's no mental toughness tested involved in this. I've had plenty of friends tell me they put the book aside because they were pregnant and they took it up later and they were fine. Uh, so I always try to say that. And then I try to stress how very, very queer this series is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a really old Tumblr post that I see every once in a while that says, you know, some readers, is there are too many gay characters in this and it's just not realistic. And you're like, meanwhile, I haven't seen a straight person in four days. Mm -hmm. I gave myself permission in these books to create the queerest community and the queerest universe possible. So if you are hoping for more gays in your post-apocalyptic and adventure yes, stories, please. I got what you need. Mm, thanks. Yes. No, it's hard to say exactly what's realistic, right? If something is real to one person and that's a part of their experience, then it is real. Right. And I'm sure there are people who think they only know one gay person and they feel like that's a a reasonable mixture, but that does not reflect my experience in the slightest. No, not at all. So we're going to take some audience questions now because there are a lot of people that want to hear from you. Um, Great. So our first question is from Sage. Um, how did it feel when you were first published, especially since I know that you were writing um, so many essays and short stories before you had your first novel. So you must have been obviously really excited, but. I was really excited. Uh, I actually didn't publish many short stories before I had my first novel out. I kind of did that backwards, but I was a journalist. So I, I had the experience of putting my work out on a tight turnaround schedule, having an editor's hand in my work and uh, getting to know what the experience of hearing back from the public is like, that's very valuable. But uh, I, I've had an unusual and difficult life, and I tried to set goals that I thought were reasonable but still dreamy. So for a long time, my one goal was if I could publish a book, I would have accomplished all that I wanted in life. Mm -hmm. Published The first edition of Midwife was published by a, a micro-publisher in L.A. called Sybaritic Press, and it had uh, not much reach and not many readers. And even then, it was enough for me. It was really all I wanted to be able to put my hands on a book with my name on the cover. So I was... I was happier and felt more accomplished than I had ever been. I, I had reached my life goal and then I had to start thinking about what that meant and what my next life goal was going to be. But it was incredible. The, I always tell people publishing, even now, mm -hmm. feels like being King Kong on cocaine. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, now we both have our hands on a book with your name on it, quite literally. It's so bad. Sometimes if I'm having a bad day, I can put my hands on all three and think to myself, at least I have done this. Have you ever have you ever gone into a bookstore and just looked for your own book? I always have wondered if authors do that. <laughs> yes. There are some stores where I know I'm constantly stocked, so sometimes I just breeze past it mm -hmm. and sort of myself. I've also been surprised. And then one of my favorite things is people send me pictures of my book in bookstores and libraries oh. and air, air, airports all over the world. That is so sweet. Like the, it's the coolest thing. I call them love letters. And it's the best when it's it's a place that I've never even been. Like I got a picture from a, an airport in Australia and I've never been on the continent of Australia. Mm -hmm. And yet there's my book traveling further than I have ever gone in my life. That's incredibly beautiful. <laughs> so another question. Um, oh, this is an interesting one from Eleanor. Uh, is there Ooh. anything that you would change in any of the books that you've written? Maybe you have a different perspective now or an experience in your life has kind of made you reflect back. That is such a good question. I am not a person who engages much in regret, but... For the uh, best. I think so. Uh, if, if there was anything that I thought 
that had come out in my books that had hurt anybody, I would want that changed. I would want to fix that. Um, I'm really grateful that I haven't heard that in, in most of my feedback. Um, there was a slight possibility with the way that I wrote The Unnamed Midwife that it could be enjoyed and perhaps used as rhetoric by uh, trans-exclusive radical feminists mm-hmm. or Turks. And I, I never wanted it to be taken that way. And then when I reread it after it was republished, I realized that it could have been. And that was one of the motivations to make uh, to make the book of Edda what it was and to introduce ever more gender fuckery, just to underline the idea that I am not one of you people. Of course. No, I don't think it'll be misinterpreted now, for sure. <laughs> Thank the gods. Definitely not. Um, oh, here's a good question from Laura. Uh, did you ever envision yourself as anything else besides an author, including, you know, any childish whims of fantasy in which you're a fighter pilot or anything along those lines? <laughs> there were a couple of other things I wanted to be. Uh, when I was a kid, I really wanted to be an opera singer. I really loved to sing, and I, I very much romanticized the ideal of singers like uh, like Maria Callas or Leontine Price, and I've always been a big dramatic personality and I really love diamonds and gowns. So that seemed like a good job for me. Uh, that's a difficult business to get into, uh, probably much more so than writing. Uh, so that didn't pan out. Uh, I was, I did take classes for a degree in massage therapy and I still really like the skills that I gathered there. And I did think about being a body worker of one kind or another. Uh, I worked in many industries but mostly retail when i was younger and i've worked in journalism i loved being a journalist but it's a really difficult field to make but almost all the time no matter what else i was doing or what else i was dreaming about i was writing Mm -hmm. even when i wanted to be an opera singer i was writing the story of what it would be like to be an opera singer more than i was pursuing the opera so it's it's quite something to look back through your life and find that thread that runs through everything. And then it's something else entirely to hit the jackpot of luck and get to do it. So there've been other things along the way, but this was always there. Do you feel that even your, even your experiences in retail, and I ask because most of us have worked in retail at some point. Of course, um, yeah. Have even those experiences made it into your writing? Interactions with Absolutely. people? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. People will say things to you when you're working retail or when you're waiting tables that they will say to you under no other circumstances. Yeah, oh, definitely. So it, <laughs> as much as it was a drudgery and as much as it, it, I don't think it was good to build character or any of those things people make it out to be, I did learn a lot from it that went into my writing. I also, I have a novel that I just finished writing mm. where the works in a big box hardware store because that's where I worked. And I took several specific instances and funny stories from that job because they sound like fiction when you tell them to people. They really do. (laughs) They do. You always think no one's ever going to believe this happened, but it all really does. So that sounds like a teaser for an upcoming project. I know, (laughs) I know that you've been, uh, you said that you've been wanting to break into YA, but are there any sneak peeks that we can have at any future projects from you? I wish I had more uh, complete news to share on that, but I will say that uh, uh, the YA novel that I wrote last year has been submitted to an editor, and I may be wow. soon. Okay. And it, it draws heavily from my own experience as a young teenager, so it is it is more of a self portrait than anything else I've produced. So of course I feel vulnerable about it, but I'm really looking forward to it coming out anyway. Absolutely. And now, how was writing YA different to you from writing something that was for an older age range or just a different genre? I needed to read a lot more YA to understand the market and to understand the kind of language that YA writers use. Uh, You know, you think you remember what it was like to be a kid and you think you remember all those books that you read, but the The truth is YA has changed so much as an industry since then that almost none of that was useful. And I have a a really great writer friend, Maggie Takuda Hall, who kind of clued me in on that. I gave her what my my comparison titles were for that book. Mm -hmm. And she was like, yeah, those are all 20 years old. Yeah. So that's a good friend. So I read a lot more. I had to remind myself that I can't say fuck all the time in a YA novel because I do do that. (laughs) A couple, yeah. Uh, Maggie, again, told me that these words are just really loud on the page. So when you use mm-hmm. them, you have to really mean them. I had to realign the, the way I write about gender and sexuality because those are important topics and they're, they're in the best YA novels all the time, but they're talked about a little bit differently. And then I had to remind myself how kids talk because it's really easy to make a kid much stupider than kids are or mm-hmm. much 
are concerned Absolutely. about. Absolutely. You know, kids don't talk about the price of real estate or how long the line for brunch was. Probably not, no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have less of an opportunity to eavesdrop on children than I do on adults, but I did find places. I found a, a bakery in West Portal in San Francisco that's right next to a school, and a lot of kids come in there after school and, like, get a cookie and a glass of milk and chill, and it's really great. And I just got to listen to them talk and figure out what it naturally sounded like. Absolutely. Did you have any? Did you have any favorites when you were reading? Any anything that you kind of used as reference or inspiration for your work? Not reference like you copied the story. That is not what <laughs> no, I meant. But uh, sources of inspiration. Absolutely. Uh, so I wanted to write about some really hard topics and uh, and the way that kids learn to wield the power of the internet before they know how powerful it truly is. Of Erin Jade Lang's book Butter was mm -hmm. a guideline for me on that. It's harrowing and difficult to read and very true to life and perfect. And then um, what's the other one? Oh, I mean, of course, The Hate You Give mm -hmm. being... Absolutely. I mean, Angie Thomas is very much uh, the, the perfect writer for our times. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't and, but I, I mostly dove into the books of books written by women who are looking at these really hard issues and writing very true to life characters. And I, I owe them a great deal. Of course. Um, so let's take another audience question. Uh, okay. Do you think being very confident helps or hurts writers? Well, that is an interesting one. It is easy to confuse confidence with thinking you're never. It's, uh, I think it's great for anybody to be confident in their work and to know what it's worth and to know what they're good at and to understand what their place in the universe is. Uh, but there are a lot of people who believe confidence is never asking for advice and never re-examining your own work and mm -hmm. never allowing an editor to say that they know better and never understanding when someone tells you that your work is insensitive or uh, that, it, it's, um, that it ignores important things. So I think confidence is great and everybody should have some. And I think arrogance is often misbranded. And uh, if you don't have people in your life who will sit you on your ass and tell you the difference, fix your life. Very good, very good advice. Um, so speaking on the subject of advice, um, Alexandra asks, do you have any advice for high school dropouts? Which is a bit of a heavy question uh, so I am myself a high school dropout. Mm -hmm. Find the question. Uh, I struggled with that as a part of my identity for a long time uh, because I thought of myself as smart. And part of how I failed out of high school was cutting class to go to the library, which is not a great idea, kids. Don't do that. Uh, I knew that my horizons would be limited because I hadn't finished high school. But honestly, my life fell apart in such a fundamental way that allowed me to drop out of high school that it, it hardly mattered at the time. I was barely surviving. My advice for high school dropouts is to remember that these limits are an illusion and that there are so many ways to remediate if you're worried that that's what's holding you back. I'm a GED holder. Uh, it's really inexpensive in most states and very easy to obtain a GED. And when I did mine, I did mine in the state of Oregon and the woman administering the test started to give us a lecture that I thought was going to be I don't know, moralizing or, or in some way uh, diminishing what we were doing that day. And she told us that she got her DED, GED and then pursued her degree in ancient Greek history. And, mm -hmm. and it was so unexpected. And she really wanted us to remember that there was nothing we couldn't do after this. This was just a hurdle. So I, I recommend the GED if it's possible for you. I recommend community college systems in every state, but especially in California, because that's where I figured out what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. Uh, most states have waiver programs or grant programs that make it possible for you to go for free or close to free if you don't have the money. And I mean, I did this living with roommates, working full-time retail. And, uh, and I also got to publish my first piece of research and, uh, and present at UC Irvine and have real one-on-one -on -one time with teachers who knew who I was and were totally invested in where I was going. And, there's so much help out there and it's it's much easier now that everybody has the internet and it means it means long hours in the library it means scheduling going to school two days a week and working the other five 
it means drudgery if you want to follow it through to a university education. But there's also trade schools. There's also jobs you can learn by doing them. There's also unions that'll bring you on as an apprentice and a journeyman. And there's always something better. And there's no reason to think that high school is the end of who you are or what you're going to do. High school is nothing. High school is a low stakes ass world and it does not define you. What a great turn of phrase. <laughs> I think I may have lifted that from Rick and Morty, just to be fully transparent. Well, it is very accurate, regardless of where it came from. <laughs> that was extremely thorough, well-considered advice. But I have to ask, in what ways did these early experiences kind of come into your writing? Do you feel the echoes of that time period when you're working on your stories? Always. Uh, I, I find that people who haven't experienced just bodily exhaustion... Uh, they forget, you know, if, if you're in a, a chase scene or a fight scene, not only are you hurt, not only are you scared, but you're tired. Everything hurts because you're tired and you just don't have what it takes to get through. Absolutely. I have this thing where my fight scenes are usually ended quickly, but I've seen a lot of fights in my life. They're mostly over in seconds. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these epic battles are only possible between highly trained fighters who don't gas immediately. So I think about that. I think about the way hours of drudgery either give you an opportunity to check out of your brain or check deeply into it and have conversations with yourself you might never otherwise ever get to have. And uh, I, I try to work that into my stories. I also try to work how difficult bureaucracies can be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'll put up obstacles for no other reason except to be an obstacle and that they can totally change the flow of your life afterwards because someone couldn't find the right form or someone forgot to file something on time or the office was closed five minutes early when you got there. And uh, those are happenstances that are experienced deeply and primarily by people in poverty. And uh, I, I never forget those things and those, those, tiny, those tiny door openings and closings. If things don't go your way, then the rest of your life goes sideways. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have a comment. Let's give you a comment uh, from Sammy. You are such an amazing woman and I love you tremendously. Great positivity <laughs> there. That's so nice. Thank you. Um, and then a question about this series itself from Chris. Mm -hmm. What was your influence for setting it in an apocalyptic world? These are some of my favorite stories. Uh, so it was one of the things that I knew I always wanted to do. I was really influenced on the apocalyptic setting by Stephen King, my blue collar writer dad, and uh, especially his book, The Stand, which I think is a masterpiece, except for the last fifth. Sorry, Steve. Uh, I also, I had my world totally blown apart by Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that might be one of the most affecting books I've ever read. I was fully just steeped in nihilism and, and depressed for maybe six weeks after reading that. And I was thinking about the way that it deconstructs the world we live in now by destroying it and making it an object of grief and aspiration. And I just loved that. But uh, all of these inspired me, uh, all of the post-apocalyptic stories that I, I inspired me because like 90% of them are written by men and the female characters in them, they're not even people. Of I course. mean, as much as, and as much as Cormac McCarthy is like a wizard of the English mm -hmm. language, like there's one woman character in that book she disappears immediately, like after giving birth to a child. And of uh, she has a really misogynist death scene where she like calls herself a whore and says she's going to go have sex with death. Right. You know, as you do in a stressful situation. Like one does. Right. That's definitely how most of us sign off. Mm -hmm. uh, so, But every time I read one of these books, even the ones I really loved, I was just angry all the time. Because there was just these cardboard cutouts strutting in and out of these gorgeous masterpiece stories uh, who had no desires and had nothing different about them from men and were conveniently chaste and conveniently pregnant and conveniently dead. Hated it. So I was mostly motivated and inspired by hatred. <laughs> Well, you certainly do an excellent job of inserting women's narratives into this genre and exploring gender throughout. Um, one more question about kind of your story building from Lexi. When writing a trilogy, does it start out as a larger story or do you just start writing a single book and it grows along the way? 
I can only tell you what I've done because I'm not sure how it is for other writers. Well, you've done it well, so please share your advice. <laughs> I wrote the book of the unnamed midwife as a single standalone story. I knew I knew where it was going to start, where it was going to end. I knew everything about that character. And it wasn't until I had finished that I realized that I wanted her diary to become an object of tribal history keeping and tribal veneration. I So the Book of the Unnamed Midwife has what we call in literary terms a frame tale mm -hmm. uh, in the front and back with uh, with a start and finish of like, why are we here? Why are we listening to this? And that's a that's something that I got from my studies at per Berkeley because uh, Chaucer does that in the Canterbury Tales. It's, it's in the Decameron, that's in the Book of Job, the way it's written in the Bible. And I, I love that as a conceit, I wanted to do it. I wanted to have a fancy literary curriculum on this thing. But also, I wanted the frame tale to tell us why we have this story to begin with. Because most people's diaries after an apocalypse are just going to, they're going to line bird nests and they're going to be torn apart by the wind. And there had to be a reason why this one survived. So when I had the idea for the frame tale, I knew immediately who had the book and, and how long it had been and where we were going. So it happened very naturally in my case that one book became another, became another. And then in Edda, I was just, I fell in love with Flora and I mm -hmm. wanted to know more about her. So it seemed very, it, it seemed as natural to follow Flora into the next book as it is to follow a very attractive woman and ask her nicely if you, know, you can have her phone number. <laughs> Of course. I think a lot of people have fallen in love with Flora, not just you. So I hear it. She's mm, awesome. She is. But, uh, but uh, in the case of especially science fiction and fantasy, I think the question is, how big is your world? Mm -hmm. If the world is big enough for a single book, I think you'll know that. I think you'll feel its confines. And you need to, to dream it a little bigger or dig it a little deeper if you want it to expand. But uh, when I started writing this world, it felt cavernous. It still does. And I knew that I had a lot of room to spread out. Absolutely. So we have another comment, actually. I lied about that being the last one. Uh, okay. This is from Joe. So just a shout out that I love you, Meg. You're one of the most <laughs> inspirational friends I know in person. Oh, OK. So you'll have to thank someone after this. I know um, who this is, yeah. I'm watching this while multitasking at work. Heart. <laughs> very, very sweet. That's very sweet. Joe's the best and also a talented writer. It means a lot. Well, um, I think we have one more question as well. So this is from this is from Lexi again, probably in response to your other question. Um, so this is about the 40% that you removed when you were doing rewrites. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any of those any of those sections that you wish that you had kept or do you think it was the right decision? Everything that you left out? It was absolutely the right decision. Uh, it, it's it's really easy when writing characters into a dystopia to imagine nothing good happening for them or to them. And uh, I, I never want to join the, the Barrier Gaze Club, never. But I was so upset about everything. I was so unhappy with the way things were going on a national and international scale that I was all set to, to end this thing in tragedy and to, to leave almost everybody destitute and I, I couldn't do it. It was the election and it was also my own feelings. And it was also, I, I read a great many posts on different forums from people who were looking for a story where a trans woman was happy in the end. She was happy and alive and loved and safe and secure. And I, 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 I was like, I have this literally in my hands. I can, I can have Flora in the end, part of a family and in a safe place and uh, securely seen into her old age and looking back on the entire fruit of her life and thinking about how much she's changed and just all of these possibilities open before me and I was thinking I can do this right I can I can give Flora something like a happy ending and it doesn't it doesn't make her life easier and it doesn't it doesn't fix the relationship with her child but I just I realized I could keep her safe so I did so I, yeah, no regrets. Of course. No, these happy endings are so, so rare uh, for queer people in these kinds of stories and any stories. So thank you so much for uh, the ending that you have included. Uh, I and many others appreciate it. Thanks for reading. That's awesome. Of course. So before we conclude, um, yeah. we need to know where we can find you and where we can find this book. So if you want to drop your social media handles, now would definitely be the time. Absolutely. So I talk constantly on Twitter. I'm at Meg Elison. Mm -hmm. 
a Facebook author page. If you look for Maggie Listen, same thing. You can check out my website, MaggieListen.com, where I try to keep an updated list of all my appearances. I'm going to be doing some book events for Flora in uh, in Riverside County and L.A. and then in D.C. next week. Excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm my full name on Instagram, Megan Elison with an H. Uh, so you can find me there. I know that's where all the cool kids are. I have a free newsletter through Tiny Letter that you can find on my website. And I also have a Patreon also listed under Meg Elison where I do short stories, both audio and written every month. I also offer handwritten letters with a fancy wax seal because I like to pretend I'm the Pope. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It was extremely insightful. And thank you so much to everyone who tuned in. Please, please go check out Meg Elison's work as you've heard, it's phenomenal. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. All right. Thank you so much for watching.